Well, good old days. But a little thing fell into my hand the other day, and I, I, I have no clue how long ago it was that I wrote it down, but it was this story. Written by somebody that traveled in the dark continent of Africa a long time ago. And in the travels, he, tells the, he told the story in, that I had saved somewhere along the line of He's going into a village. And when he went into a village, very remote, very far away from major civilization, he ran run across a small child, a little lad in the village, and the little lad in the village was sitting on a tree stump. And he had a piece of wood in his hand, some of the great carvers of the world are on the African continent, you spent years of your life there and great masters of carving and there was a little boy who was carving and so not that wasn't rare but he was interested in the little boy so he stops and he says to the little boy what are you carving and the little boy replied that he was carving wings he said well are you carving wings for a bird? He said, no, I'm just carving wings. I'm not going to put them on a bird. He said, well, what are you going to do with the wings? And he said, I'm carving wings. And I am going to carve this set of wings and then I'm going to carve another set of wings. And the visitor was kind of, well, that's strange. And he turns and he says to the chief or one of the elders why, why is he carving wings and said well he always just carves wings just a set of wings and a set of wings and a set of wings and so the man went back and said tell me why you're carving wings and he says I'm carving wings because someday I am going to fly and I'm going to see the whole world I'm going to fly out of this place and see the world. So I would like to ask you the question today. If I walked up to you right now and I said, what are, what are you thinking about? And what are you doing? And what are you carving? I would hope that there would be some of us in this room who would say, I'm carving wings. Because I plan on growing. I plan on moving upward. I'm moving out of my despair my discouragement, my weariness, my negativity. I'm going to get to the next level. So I'm carving wings. And it may look absurd to you. It may seem impossible to you. But there's just something on the inside of me that says, I'm going to carve wings until somehow these wings take me out of this place and lift me to where I ought to be. And so I'd like for us to ponder something that will make us a little uncomfortable. What would we do and what should we do if we would be caught, and I believe we are, and I'm going to make the case, we would be caught as I am going to try to say that the culture is caught today and our country to some degree is caught today in a trap of sorts. There's, there, there's not an easy way to solve the problems of the world that we face right now, whether you're looking at the political aspects or you're looking at the cultural aspects. It's very complicated. What should we be thinking and what should we be doing? And maybe the little child, the little boy in the African village had the answer. You've got to carve yourself some wings. You've got to get the right attitude because you will never escape the situation unless you can believe that it is possible. And as absurd as it may see, seem to some of you, I believe that it is possible for the church to have an impact on our culture. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to challenge you today for all of us to work together and let's let the world know that they can find a solution, that they can carve themselves, figuratively speaking, some wings to get out of the sinful trap that the devil and the Antichrist has pushed them into. 
I don't know about you, but I don't think it's time to give up on society or culture, and I know there's a lot of bad stuff. I look around. I said to Sister Mooney the other day while I was thinking going down the road, and I said, look, you can't just say, well, we'll spend the rest of our life condemning everything that's wrong with this world, and there surely is a lot to condemn, pointing out all the evil and pointing out all the tremendous uh, complexities of culture. Somewhere, somebody has got to say... I still believe there is a solution. There's a God that can. There's a God that will. And he's waiting for us. Anybody here still believe in God? Anybody here still believe in God? Now I know what people say when they, and you know, when we look at the problems, and I'm not going to make a whole list of problems because we know what we're facing, so many things. But We might say, well, the educators need to step up and the educators need to do that. And surely we need perhaps some, many perhaps improvements in education. Or you might say, well, I believe the politicians need to get uh, get on the scene and give us some solutions and write some new regulations and all of that. And of course, we do need help. Or what about the culture and the society? We just push it on whoever it is that's in control of that. Maybe we ought to talk to the movie producers and the, uh, the, uh, the game producers and, uh, and, and, and the people that provide entertainment. Maybe we ought to look at them and say, well, it's your responsibility. You've got to do something. Or maybe we should say, well, what about all of these rich people, these philanthropists, people that want to help us? They need to give us more money and we'll throw more money at all the darkness that's around us. Do you really believe that's a solution? Do you really believe that the solution is in education or that the solution is in the hands of politicians? Do you really believe that all we need to do is somehow just go back to Hopalong Cassidy movies? Do you really believe that just more money is going to solve the problem? Give us another billion dollars over here and we'll build some more gymnasiums and we'll put in some more free lunch places? Is that really going to solve the problem? And whose responsibility is it for all of this cave-in? Am I talking to some real people here today? We need to come out of fantasy world. This is not Disneyland. We're in a real world. We got real problems. And I don't mean to overemphasize this, but it's getting pretty ugly out there. The, 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 the breakdown in so many areas... It's just really frightening, the dumbing down of our culture. So I don't believe the problem really, however, is just with culture. I, I, really think, I really think that at the core of the problem is something called morals. Morals. You're not going to like this. Was it Sister Hunter that was talking to you or Sister Young? Hunters, right there. All right. You work in medicine. I'm going to quote you. Forgive me. Back me up if I got it right and correct me if I got it wrong. But syphilis is out of control again. And gonorrhea. The whole, the whole, let's not even talk about it. There's something inside. And I'm glad, by the way, I want to say, Brother Barber and the youth team, thanks for bringing the young people back up on Sunday morning. Give them a great big welcome. And we're going to have... Giving me an opportunity because I really feel a need to talk to you and, and, and speak to you as much as I possibly can. And we're going to have some great visitors this year and Sunday morning. And I, I want you to be able to be close to them. But there, and look, I'm not ragging on you, but there's something in, there's something in the minds and hearts that's, I believe, been planted there by an evil force of sort, darkness, demonic spirits, if you're not too... Uh, shocked by that, that has given the idea somehow that, that nothing you do, that you're kind of invincible. It's like I, I can commit all of these terrible things. I can participate in immoral activity. I can jump off the, uh, the skyscrapers and somehow nothing is going to harm me. The injuries are multiplying all over the country, these young men who are on these skateboards. And I think it's really amazing. But some of them take such risk that it's beyond human intellect. 
it, it, it just, it, it, it's a reflection of this thing that nothing can harm me and nothing can hurt me. But let me tell you, God enclosed our inner sexual relationship within the context of marriage because when you take it out of marriage, you got to face something called venereal diseases. And here we are supposedly an educated, sophisticated, modern country and we're having a breakdown among our young people who think they can miss all the bullets and jump off the buildings and nothing will harm them. If you smoke, you will suffer the consequences. If you do marijuana and drugs, you will suffer the consequences. If you try to have personal, interpersonal relationships outside of marriage, you will suffer the consequences. I wish I had some real people in here today. So the world is ugly. But I don't want to just go out and say to the world, you're ugly. I don't believe that helps. I believe it will just increase the bitterness and the disconnect. But I just believe that out there in this dark world and in these neighborhoods, there are some people sitting out there somewhere carving wings. They don't really know how it's going to develop, but they're inside their soul, inside their mind, inside that inner place, that place where they think their deepest thoughts and consider the big issues of their personal lives. They are carving wings and saying, just maybe, just maybe I can get out of here. Just maybe I can find a solution. You say, well, we need to get people to believe in God. And of course, that's right. But what is the first thing I've been challenging students to say, to ask themselves, well, what, what, what is the language that is going to reach this world? I, I don't have that answer. I think somebody will find that answer, the kind of language, the kind of sermonizing. And it's not about sermonizing in some kind of uh, abstract way, but I mean real preaching that somehow will find the language necessary to shake up, to turn folks around. I don't know what it is. But I, I got a little idea that it's not just to say to people, you're bad and you need to believe in God to find a solution to your badness. I believe it's got to go a little different than that, Brother Barkas. Maybe we need to say, look, it's not only important that you believe in God, but to understand that God believes in you. Right. That God made a way for you. Somehow we need to reintroduce the consciousness and the soul of our present generation that there was a love of God that caused him to robe himself in flesh and come to this earth to die that we might have life through him and to have it more abundantly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. Now that is an idea. That is a representation of something and it's a representation I believe of God's love for us. That he loves us and died for us in his, in his flesh. So you can't say, come on rich man, give us more money. And listen to what I'm going to say now. I believe our problem is the prophet's problem. It's the pastor's problem. The problem in our country today is a problem that belongs to the pulpits and to the preachers and to the prophets and to the pastors. And we've got to get away from this idea that we can be prophets for prophet and get back or pastors for prophet. This is not a career. This is a responsibility. I have a responsibility. Your worldliness is not just your problem. Woe is me. The great apostle, the man that turned the world upside down. The man who wrote over half of the New Testament. The man who was chosen of God to preach to, G to the Jews and to the Greeks. The great apostle Paul. Woe is me, he said. If I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is he saying? He's saying, this is my responsibility. And I take it seriously because here's the way I see it, the Apostle Paul said. I see it this way. If I don't do my duty, if I don't prophesy when the Spirit says prophesy and preach when the Spirit says preach and to make it plain so that all the hearts 
and all the minds can receive the word of God or understand the word of God or hear the word of God. If I don't do that, I myself, while I'm preaching to others, will become a castaway. Now that's a man that understands his responsibility. 